All right, I'd like to call this meeting of the West Sussex Milwaukee School Board to order. Ms. Lee, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sarah. Would you please call the roll? Yes. Mrs. Carr? Here. Ms. Deal? Here. Mrs. Kaiser? Here. Mr. Burns? Mr. Becker? Here. Mrs. Lee? Here. Mr. Sikich? Present. Mr. Keller? Here. President Lee? Here. Proper notice that this meeting has been posted in accordance with the open meeting laws of the state of Wisconsin. Do we have any modifications to the agenda this evening? There are no, no modifications. All right, we'll move right into our showcase tonight for Mitchell Elementary. So the board is going to swap your seats. So we're going to move around over there and then we're going to hear from you. Okay. If you need to rotate the table, feel free. Hello, I'm Nicholas Sackett, and I'm a fifth grader at Mitchell Elementary School. Hi, my name is Sophia Towson. I'm a fifth grader at Mitchell Elementary School. Hi, my name is Melanie Massa, and I'm a fifth grader at, Ele at Mitchell Elementary School. Hi, my name is Piper Ship, and I'm a fifth grader at General Mitchell Elementary School. And we are going to share our playground projects with you. These are our I Can State. I can create a presentation using pictures, video, and audio to share my new learning without teacher support. I can use feedback from my peers and adults to improve my writing, creating, and speaking. I can contribute responsibly and partner in group settings. I can respect and consider different opinions and ideas. How it started. We learned in the spring of 2024 that our PTA and Ms. Schwal were planning on raising funds for a new playground. The idea came about after Dr. Robinson met with parents earlier in the year during his meet and greet sessions. At classes, our September challenges were to design an ideal playground, choose our own groups, follow the engineering design processes, and decide how we would share our team's design. Planning and designing. First, we made mini blueprints and look and looked at models of the playground. So we picked our teams. Next, we made blueprints and models. Finally, we recorded our projects. So we have a short project to share that works. There's no sound. There's supposed to be sound. Yeah. This was one of our We can have a better Mitchell playground. We can have a Mitchell playground. Hi, my name is Mackenzie, and we would like to see a zip line, a castle with a ball pit, a roundabout. And the play pirate tip. We think it would be really cool for our Mitchell community to have a better playground. We would ask our principal, Mrs. Schwal, and the playground committee if we could have a better Mitchell playground. That's just a brief example of one of the projects. These are our next steps. We will share our final recordings with Ms. Schwal in the Playground Fundraising Committee. We will save our ideas for a lower playground, which hopefully will get its renovation in the next year or two. I'm supposed to be winking at everyone that we want to next time. <laughs> <laughs> what kids want? All students in grade three, four, and five made their playgrounds, but then we went and gathered information from the younger kids that didn't make a playground. After asking the questions, what do you dislike about our playground? What do you like on our playground? And what, do you, and what would you want to add? This is what we figured out. 
Two people dislike the swings. Four people dislike the monkey bars. Thirteen people dislike the rock dome. One person disliked the ladders. One person disliked the tube slide. One person disliked the two person slide. And two people dislike the metal car. Tip, don't add a rock dome. And then twelve people like the monkey bars. Ten people like the swings. Two people like the metal car. Tip, add monkey bars. <laughs> And what they wanted to add was one person wanted to add a swing, 14 people wanted to add a zip line, one person wanted to add a clear side, one person wanted to add a tunnel, one person wanted to add a rock wall, four people wanted to add a merry-go-round, one person wanted to add a soccer goal, and one person wanted to add a metal car. Tip, add a zip line. <laughs> we also want our playground to be accessible to all kids. Before you at before you ask us questions, can you share what your favorite part of a playground when you were in elementary school? Thank you. When I was in elementary school, we had they wouldn't be able to do this today, but it was a big tower made out of uh, tires, <laughs> and it was you know, and you could climb up all the way to the top and go. It was really cool, but it probably wouldn't be very safe. Today. It probably wasn't very safe back then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I always I loved the swings when I was a kid, but at my school, sometimes I always got a little cool. I always wanted to throw the. We had a life size humpback whale cage on the playground, and that's the state whale for Connecticut. So I always thought that was such a cool thing to have something of that size. And the teacher could put so many fun things to do with that. Oh, the <laughs> <laughs> when I was in elementary school, padding, we had asphalt. <laughs> so if you were on the monkey bars and you fell, you were in for big time hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cars, right? They built you different back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I like about uh, I think it's so. That horse man, they had like this spinny, like very go on type thing. And like that was always like the main attraction. Like the kids would like go on and spin each other. It was like this one. Go fly Yeah. I I did not have this, but I wish we would have those Gaga pits that you guys get. Uh, I like where were those all my life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I there I know that they're on a lot of playgrounds now, and I just think that's such a good thing. That's on our lower playground that maybe could get added to in the next year or two. <laughs> I was going to say, my, my playground was like Mr. Sick and showing we didn't have the monkey part, we just had the asphalt. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of things. <laughs> For me, I like, we had like a, a large like structures you could climb up in there, and there were that went down in. There was like a little like drawbridge thing you run across, and so we used to like hang and stuff like that. So that was always fun for us. Uh, we we did we had asphalt that was covered with wood chips. <laughs> yeah. So when you fell down, you were just like stuck in you. That's all I was Okay. Anyone have questions for our students? So what are these? Our playground model. Um, Do you so, want to say oh, I'm sorry. So that's first part, then the second part. No, what, however it works is fine. So, Melanie, you can run whatever you want them to do. Go, let them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you want to explain your plan? Um. Yeah. So, it's like a huge watchtower with a slide and a tether, a, te a tether ball, um, thing, Virginia, and a merry-go-round stop. <laughs> And like one of those things that you sit on and then it spins. Explain uh, yours. Okay. Okay. So, can we go on the next? You know what? Multiple conditions. Okay, let's do the backwards. Okay, I'm going to explain the swings. Sure. Okay, so on the back, 
we have our sw this is a zip line now i know lots of you when you picture like a zip line you think one that you hang on to but we we feel like that's a little dangerous for the four kers so this one it's almost like you've seen there's this this kind of version like at the rec department in a couple of playgrounds but you just sit on it and then you hold on to like the handle and it's, it's much safer than just holding on probably flinging it off if you held on like that but and then next over here we have just a normal swing and then we have a swing that's accessible for wheelchairs and i'm turning to this side you want to explain everything so here in the front we have a double decker playground with rails and a rock wall in here and like a staircase and then there's a tunnel thing that you can go through to the other side which we forgot to make a slide but there will be a slide there and then there's a slide right here that's it yeah yes so do i just read um when we started to get ideas we did Miss Gearnser did a presentation on playgrounds all around the world, and some of the ideas that people put in there are zip lines, rock wall, seesaw, soccer goal. So it's just like a book of ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's Can drawings we... and writings. Mm -hmm. Can we pass them around for you guys so you can look at them? Okay. Do we want to pass them? Up? I can't even know. That was probably the most difficult part of this challenge was making that tiny paper book. <laughs> yeah. to, to, to fold and to follow step-by-step -step instructions. But once we got it down, we were, were professionals now. So, all right, anyone have questions for the kids at all? What was your favorite part of this whole process? Probably doing it or doing this. My favorite part was probably also building it because it was just so much fun seeing our ideas turn into different ideas and that turning into different ideas and just perfecting our and it's just making it perfect. My favorite part was also building it because it was just very fun and it was challenging at one point, but then we perfected it. Mine was building my playground. Yeah. Even though it's in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think what was your biggest challenge? Coming, coming up with ideas that are safe for kindergartners. Oh. I'd have to say, like, kind of the same thing, um, because some things aren't really safe, like the zip line that you hold on to. So we had to, like, think of other ideas, and we came up with a seat zip. Okay, so something that was, like, kind of like the challenging was almost like the uh, my favorite part was building it but it was also probably the most challenging part since we only had a few days to build it but I feel like both of them turned out looking great for me the most challenging part was probably doing the booklets because I don't like writing <laughs> What is your favorite part of the playground? What what feature did you really want to see in this? Um, a tetherball. Probably the seated zipline. I feel like that'd be so cool. The zipline or the swings, higher swings, also the double decker playground. <laughs> the same. So. So my favorite thing when I was a kid was also the 
doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to the doesn't respond to um for me probably like building and making sure like it doesn't fall um like homework and also building um mm -hmm. Making the um booklets because they kept unfolding. Yeah. Um, probably. Yeah. Um. Probably the teamwork in the building. Kind of like a screen but you have one person on each side. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, well, I can't say that you guys uh, it was something about the taking that from writing to which one of the ones that I'm creating. Probably the same thing as Nicholas creating. Same thing, creating. Creating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This ties into our real life problem of trying to get a new playground for our upper part of Mitchell. So I thought it just fit in really well to start at the beginning of the year. And the final, final step, well, this team of four will take everyone's video and creations and put it into either an iMovie or a CapCut then to share with Mrs. Schwal and our playground team so they can see what everyone would like to see. We have some prototypes of playgrounds, but it's not quite finished yet. So. Yeah, they, these guys are fabulous. They did a great job. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Great project. Thank you so much. But all of the parents that are in, in, in here, would you please stand, please? The parents and teachers, please. Please stand. Let's give them a hand as well. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Mitchell Elementary, for coming and showing us on what's going on at your school. It's great to see that, and I'm looking forward. I've heard about the playground before, so I'm uh, looking forward to see as that progresses. So thank you so much for coming and talking to us tonight. So with that, move on to number seven, item seven, our superintendent's report. Good evening. Are we ready? I guess I can add some more comments. We're working on it. <laughs> there we go. We're ready. Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. 
in our legislative updates, 2425 general aid figures released by DPI. The Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction has released certified financial figures for, for state general school aids for school year. Uh, the figures are based on previous year data, including student counts and year-end financial data. Aid amounts vary by district, with 60% of the 421 districts receiving more aid than in the 23-24 school year. Aids are paid in four installments and are the largest form of state support for PK through pre-K through 12 uh, schools in Wisconsin. We'll have a lot more information and details coming up uh, as we uh, go through our, our budget, um, final budget approval tonight. So we're looking forward to, to the uh, legislative updates that are directly tied to that. Our Educators of the Month, congratulations to our October Educators of the Month. Ruth Glish, Special Education Teacher at uh, West Milwaukee Intermediate School. She is an ID teacher. I, I had the opportunity to visit her in her class uh, as we honored her uh, on last week. So congratulations to Ruth Glish. Also, Bobby Foreman. Bobby Foreman is a program manager with the Recreation Department. Bobby is a, a, a go-getter. He's a, a guy that's always behind the scenes and does not want any credit for anything that he does. But we were excited to recognize him uh, during uh, this, this particular uh, presentation as the uh, October Educator of the Month um, for the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District. So, uh, again, congratulations to Ruth and to Bobby for being recognized for the month of October. Thank you to the entire DOCKEY staff for hosting a large group of professionals for a tour on October 7th. This is a huge celebration for our school and staff. 18 guests who were attending a CISA 1 Institute for Personalized Learning Conference selected DOCKEY PBL High School as their main site visit for the conference. The guests were from Parkway School District from outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Parkway has visited DOCKEY five to six other times in the last few years to gain inspiration on how to embed uh, more personalized and authentic learning into their school. Way to go, Doc. Mm -hmm. Knights of Columbus Coke Distribution. On Friday, I had the opportunity, along with uh, board member Carr, to visit Horace Mann, and uh, along with the Knights of Columbus, uh, we distributed nearly 200 jackets to students at Horace Mann. To see the, the, the smiles on these kids' faces, it just really made my day. Mm -hmm. It was truly a great uh, event. I want to uh, send a, a special shout out to Dr. Erica Menslaw on, uh, and, and Sarah Shepard for helping to facilitate the distribution, as well as Carolyn Hahn, our Director of Commun Communications and Engagement. And also, I want to send a shout out to uh, uh, Erica's uh, parents. Uh, Dr. Menslaw's parents were also there to support a uh, huge uh, shout out again to the Knights of Columbus, who are a true partner uh, with the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District. Other updates. Community visits. On October 15th, referendum session at the West Dallas Senior Center. The 16th, City Schools Monthly Meetings. The 18th, Nathan Hale Fall Music Department Concert. We conducted instructional rounds at Hale, Mitchell, Irving, Horace Mann, Hoover, Walker, Jefferson, and Pershing. I participated on 1018 at the Mitchell Elementary School SOAR pep rally. 1018 Central Homecoming Parade and football game. Referendum engagement sessions at Hale as well as FLW. Our, on 1025, again, I just mentioned the coat drive at Horace Mann. And then on 1025, I had the pleasure of attending the West Dallas Boys playoff volleyball game. And uh, congratulations to that to, to, our, to our boys who defeated Whitnell on Friday night. <laughs> As we uh, announced on last week and, and introduced our, our students by name, I wanted to recognize tonight's uh, student advisory member. His name is Devin Williams. Devin is a senior at West Dallas Central High School. He is a native of South Carolina. I learned that in talking to him uh, two weeks ago. He is a president of the National Honor Society and of the Black Student Union. He's a member of the Central uh, Orchestra. He plays the bass. He's the pit orchestra for uh, musicals jazz band and varsity volleyball team so he was actually on the team that i saw the other night uh, when their playoff game uh, leadership team member of interact student council and hope squad and he is a salutatorian for west alice central high school and i'm going to uh, open the floor at this time for Devin to formally introduce himself okay. hi <laughs> <laughs> um welcome thank Come. you so i'm sure many of you have probably seen me somewhere before um, I'm Devin. Um, 
that's about it. I don't really know. <laughs> I'm overly involved, as my mom would say. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know what else. That's okay. We'll we'll get you. We'll get it. We'll get it out of you later on. <laughs> just relax. Uh, just just enjoy the the opportunity, and we're uh, grateful that you're here mm -hmm. and to to represent the the students of our district uh, on our board tonight. Okay. Yeah. Right. That concludes our superintendent's report for tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. On to item uh, eight, our public comments this evening. Um, there is currently no one signed up for public comments. If there's anyone in uh, Zoom who would like to address the board, um, there should be a link in the chat to sign up. Um, I will wait for 15 seconds to see if there's anyone who would like to do that. Seeing none, I will close public comment at this time. We'll move on to item nine, our board reports for the evening. Starting with 9.1, our review of the board calendar. Um, tonight, we have a regular board of education meeting where we will approve our final budget and tax levy for the 24-25 school year. And then we have a DLBA workshop on November 11th at 6 p.m. with a regular board of education meeting. On November 18th, 6 p.m., we have a board workshop on student services and supports. And November 25th at 6 p.m., we have a the Board of Education meeting where we'll be discuss the state report card results, uh, where we also have a state court report card results workshop. Moving on to 9.2, Board Committee report, starting with 9.2.1, Employee Engagement and Culture. Mr. Keller. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, we met on Tuesday, October 15th. Uh, during our agenda or during our meeting, we we talked about vacancy rate, which has dipped up just a little bit, but it's still uh, below 1.5%. Uh, we also talked about the EEO5 report. Um, that's a report that's submitted by annually, usually done in October, but we were notified by the EEOC that that form has been delayed this year. Um, we're also currently undergoing the process of Y staff reporting. Um, that's with the Wisconsin Information System for Education. Um, it's complete of um, it's com comprised of five core co components. Um, some of that's demographic information, licensing info, contact details, assignment information, and so forth. So the HR department is responsible for, for, for providing that data and are currently undergoing that task. Um, we talked a little bit about substitute fill rates. Um, that. Um, has been a little bit of a challenge um, this year. Um, the rates have dipped a little bit from, from last year. So we're continuing to look at ways to address those fill rates. Um, and then finally, we talked about a suggestion box and what we can do um, in, in that regard. Um, we'd like that to be able to be a little bit more confidential. And the problem, problem is offices are under surveillance. Uh, surveillance. Um, so there's some collection difficulties there. So we talked about alternatives such as, you know, uh, inner office or U.S. postal mail um, so that people could send suggestions that way. Um, otherwise, we also mentioned uh, we are going to dive deeper into the exit interview in an up, uh, exit interview data in an upcoming meeting. And that was what we discussed on the 15th. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Keller regarding his report? Ms. Kaiser? Um, I don't know if you can answer straight up. Uh, what do we, what is our current rate for substitute teachers? Um, did, I can answer that a little bit. So, um, so far overall this year, we are, I mean, it's an estimate here. It is somewhere between, I want to say about 63%, if I'm reading the graph right. Oh, no, I meant the daily. Pay. Like oh, the daily pay. I'm yeah. sorry, you said right. I was talking about I apologize. That's, my That's okay. Um, I do not recall that number right now. We can check that and get that back. Thank you. you. I know we increased it a couple Yeah. Years. Yeah, we, we did. did. And I don't recall it. Um, um, I feel like one fifty we're giving number. a higher rate for Friday bills. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the most challenging day, Friday, Friday, Friday Mondays, Friday? maybe. Yeah. Uh, it might be worthwhile revisiting that and see if we can pull data from area districts to see where we are in relation to our pay compared to area districts. Obviously, that's where our main competitors are going to be coming from. 
um, to see if I know we raised it to try to be more competitive. So the question is that they also do the same thing, right? Um, yeah. We can see if we need to look at that again. So it might be something worthwhile to do. Any other questions for Mr. Keller regarding his report? Or any uh, agenda, any items for a future agenda? If not, thank you very much, Mr. Keller. Thank you. Move on to 9.2.2, financial stability and efficiency. Mr. Burns. Yes, thank you. Uh, we actually just met tonight, uh, had a short meeting uh, for a couple of pieces that we were dealing with. Some old yeah. talking about health insurance, uh, should follow up and having some in-person meetings that are coming up and encouraging people to come and attend those so that they can get uh, information on what changes are going to be there and, and how it's going to impact them. Uh, additionally, it will be recorded, so that's something that we can send out as well, so that if they're unable to make any of the upcoming sessions, uh, that will be available for them. Uh, we also continue to explore the early admission for kindergarten component, where we're just kind of flushing out what what would go on with that, uh, and I think that we uh, will be continuing to work with that a little bit, and then also probably including one of the other committees um, to see what that would look like as well for uh, people who would come to the board at all, just so that it's fully vetted. Um, but that's that's still a bit of a discussion and still a little bit out. And then, of course, we had our discussion on just the presentation of what our budget and tax levy certification will be, which is obviously going to be presented here tonight. So I won't ruin any details for Aaron. I'm sure he loves surprises. Too, so <laughs> that's my report. <laughs> no, no surprise. Oh. Every, everything's up and up. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. Do you have any questions for Mr. Burns regarding his report? or any uh, items for him to consider at future agendas. Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Burns. Move on to item 9.2.3, Recreation Community Services, Mr. Becker. Thank you. Uh, the Recreation Committee met last Monday, the 21st. Uh, uh, for old business, we touched really briefly on uh, the rec budget review and future planning. Uh, Shelly Strasser advised that she had spoken with Aaron Norris about it for uh, just touch base. But uh, the decisions are going to have to wait until after the referendum results are in. So hopefully we'll get something uh, and, uh, a little more of an update soon. Uh, we spoke about the, the athletic strategic plan. Uh, the, the subcommittees are uh, close to finished. Um, the, the, the target finish date is going to be 1031. And then uh, Ms. Strasser is going to be putting together um, a uh, presentation for the large group that's the, the original large group with coaches and ADs and parents and, and a number of people just to kind of reconvene and shape it up into a final draft uh, and then hopefully bring that to the board in December um, or to our rec committee in December excuse me uh, and then we're going to try to bring that to the board you know hopefully before the end of the year uh, but again just as Mr. Burns said on his group we got to make sure it's vetted and in decent shape before we bring it to the board um, for new business, we spoke a little bit about the the middle school programs, um, just trying to understand what's going to be the best way to run those programs. Um, just agree that we're having some issues with the way they're operating right now and, and trying to find out what might be a, a better option, um, something where maybe we, we invest a little bit more into the junior programs um, because we, we miss a lot of time with the, with the middle school sports. They, they leave in the middle of the day to go to games. They have to travel. Um, it was a bit, it was a pretty long discussion. I think we spoke for about an hour on all this stuff. So um, that's real high level, but um, more to come on that. We also spoke a little bit about uh, potential conference realignments. Um, there are some schools in the Hale conference um, that are looking to do something different. Um, and that would be in Hale's best interest. It would create a little bit more competitive balance for our programs. Um, so again, this is down the road. It's a long process, uh, a year or more, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go through different boards and different uh, reviewing bodies through the WIAA. So it, it will be a while, but um, there are conversations going on between the different schools. Um, that's about all I got. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Becker. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Becker regarding his report? 
I have one, Mr. Becker, regarding the conference realignment. Was that only looking at Hale? Or was Central also being considered for that as well? Uh, my understanding was Hale was the only one that would be affected by it. And this year, it's just for football. But that's what I was told. And next year will be for all sports. Yep. So this year is just for football. Correct. Mm. Right, right. That is in my notes. Just, yeah, it's a lot. Thank and so you. then that would also affect um, any co-op sports that were housed at Hale. Because I understand the co-op, you have to pick one school or the other in which they're held or housed at. Is that correct? I would imagine, yes. If it's so I don't know any co-op sports for next year um, mm -hmm. that, would, that would affect. Because I know a lot... I might even say majority of the sports we have now are, are co-opt. So um, something else to keep in mind for that. So good to know. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Becker regarding his report? Or any items to be considered at future agendas? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Becker. Mm -hmm. Move on to 9.3 board member reports of community events. Any events board members attended they'd like to report back on? Ms. Lee? The volleyball game, excuse me, that Dr. Robinson mentioned, I was also at that. It was awesome. There was a lot of support there, a lot of students, a lot of parents, a lot of the the T uh, players from the girls volleyball team were there to support. And it was, there were some intense moments in those games. It was not a, it wasn't an easy fight, but um, the dogs pulled out. So it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Deal? <laughs> Um, I was able uh, as a not as a board member, but as a parent to attend the FLW um, Halloween dance on on Friday. So I just wanted to it was great. The kids were great. Um, I was a little scared about having to chaperone a middle school dance. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. So um, but I just wanted to just recognize because it it wasn't just FLW, but a lot of our schools, our PTA sponsored some type of Harvest Fest or um, Halloween um uh, dance. So I just want to shout out all those uh, those uh, PTAs and also the all the volunteers who put you know effort into these events. So, all right, thank you very much. I would also like to report on events they attended. Skyzer, um, again as a parent as well, I got to attend my my daughter's first high school choir concert and band, and it was really lovely to see um, the amount of work these kids have put in in just a short period of time into the music program. I'm excited to see where. Uh, we go. Also, quick plug that um, go to West Alice, West Milwaukee Theater. Um, Damn Yankees is coming up and tickets are on sale. And I believe tickets are on sale soon. Also for the other one, I'm blanking on the name of it. So I apologize for that. <laughs> go go WAWM Theater. It'll come up and you'll see all the tickets for sale. <laughs> Oh, we actually, we're going to have to cast the major players of the, of the play here at our next meeting. Oh, so oh. Part of our uh, of picking off our plays will be to have the cast out at, at the at the meeting prior to uh, the production starting. So oh, I love that. that. Mm. That's very cool. The tickets are also is uh, Mary Poppins Jr. Yeah. Thank, that's what I thought it was. I can't remember. <laughs> thank you. I thought it was that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ms. Kaiser. Uh, and you also want to report on events that they attended? Uh, I just mentioned I'll thank for the invite to coming to the Central um, Homecoming Parade. I know that a number of us were able to attend that. Uh, it was great to be able to participate in that. Um, and uh, uh, all the other things that we uh, we have done. So, um, yeah, so it's been uh, a lot of different things. And then for 9.4, I guess one thing I want to do is um, I do want to, we, we mentioned um, uh, boys volleyball. Uh, and I, I want to congratulate the boys cross tail cross country team who will be going to state as a team. Oh, nice. um, they won they won a sectional their sectional this last weekend. Uh, so I want to congratulate them and also two um, girls yeah. from the cross country team also individually uh, made it at, to state. So I want to wish them the best of luck. You have Wisconsin, I believe it's Wisconsin Rapids still. Uh, I think this coming weekend. So they have um, they're going to do great. I know they will. <laughs> Uh, and that's all that I have. So I'll move on to our consent agenda this evening. Uh, so we have 10.1 approval of minutes from work at the Board of Education meeting on October 14th. 10.2, our employment summary. 10.3, supplementary contracts. And 10.4, our financial summary. Does anyone need anything separated out? If not, I look for a motion. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any last minute discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. We on to our action item this evening, 11.1, our 24-25 final budget and tax levy adoption. Here. Here. 
I'll start us off. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier in the uh, in the meeting, the uh, the adoption of uh, the financials, it, it has really come to the point where we have to really examine how our financials as a state are uh, are divvied up and how we're funding education. Uh, it's a disservice to students, uh, particularly students in, in poverty areas as well as of color, the way that we are currently underfunding our schools. And um, unfortunately, uh, it, this is the, the game that we are, that we're at and, and uh, elections matter. I want to say that publicly elections matter where um, we, we have to come up with a, a, a more sound way of providing funds for our schools. Mr. Norris and I have worked over the last two weeks trying to uh, come up with uh, some answers to uh, the, the inequities that we're, we're seeing financially coming from the state. And I, I think um, we are lucky as a district to have him because he's able to really come up with solutions where you know, I, I don't think a lesser person will be able to do that. And so I want to uh, publicly give him, a, him the acknowledgement of the work that he's doing with our financials. And I'm going to turn it over to him. But specifically, before I do that, um, you're going to notice throughout this presentation the effect that vouchers are having on our financials. That's just the bottom line, that uh, public education dollars are going to private schools. And unfortunately, it's really hitting us. And I don't think there's a, a solution, you know, that that's that's really there for us that's going to stop this bleeding right now. It's it's getting worse. So I'll stop. I'll get off my uh, off off my horse, and, and I'll allow uh, Aaron to walk us through the financials through his presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Robinson, and thank you everyone uh, for all your efforts. The October budget tax levy certification is always like the pinnacle of the budget year, which really gets picked off in about two months. So uh, we'll get a little bit of a breathing room and then we'll start, I think it's December 11th, typically that meeting where the board approves the budget cycle schedule for the next year. So we get about a month break before we start it all over again. So <laughs> kind of funny how it works, but um, this evening, uh, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, um, we're going to go through kind of a, a overview of, of what we discussed and the annual hearing, which is September 9th, so a little bit over a month and a half ago. Um, and uh, to go through the agenda, I'll talk through some district highlights, some of the areas of focus for the district this year, uh, beyond students, which we saw this evening. Um, we'll talk through the state biennial budget, always a point of focal, a focus point for us, because again, we're in the year two of the state biennial budget, but as I mentioned before, we're entering kind of the next biennial budget negotiation. So that advocacy that Dr. Robinson mentioned will be on full, you know, full display by all of us here in, in our own ways and advocating for what public schools need to function, actually. So um, we'll talk through the October 15th certification and the changes from a month and a half ago to today. We'll talk about how the tax levy is calculated. Again, that's not new news, but again, we'll go through what the numbers are in real. Now, the subtraction, the additions. Um, things like that. We'll talk about the all proposed funds tax levy. We'll look back a little bit to see kind of where we've been. But again, looking forward is really the most important piece for tonight. And then we'll talk about the mill rate and then obviously the recommendation certification process. So with that, again, some district highlights real high level here is um, hitting all areas of, the, of uh, our um, of our organization where we'll work through continuous improvement of the leadership through sale training. We have a six through 12 uh, curriculum math adoption here this year. Uh, professional development for all staff members working through the process with power schools. Uh, this year, the board or the prior year, the board approved for this year, a CPA increase for all staff at 5%. That's included in the budget. Uh, obviously, the board's been well apprised of some health insurance changes we've working through. As Mr. Burns mentioned earlier in our report, those will begin next week um, and, and throughout the open enrollment process, which goes through November 18th for staff and, and our retirees. Um, we have some recreation projects through uh, Ms. Strasser's uh, departments, the east side and the west side, and then um, a continued focus on safety with our district safety coordinator, Marla Martin, now. So the state biennial budget is a two-year agreement that goes through the end of the school year. 
as you're aware of, we received all public schools received a $325 increase in revenue. So with approximately 7,000 students, that's about two point, uh, just under $2.3 million in increased revenue this year. That amount, as I'll get to later, um, adds up for us to be um, about 2.8% of an operating revenue. So when inflation and things like that su surpass 3%, not just in core inflation, but in other areas of our organization are significantly impacted. Things like health insurance, things like transportation contracts, things like building materials, things like that beyond just core compensation have some significant impact. So when we talk about 3% is not enough, it's not just that it's tied to inflation, it's tied to everything, right? Um, additionally, schools did not receive an increase in per people categorical aid. Those are dollars outside the revenue limit coming straight from the state of Wisconsin. So that's an area where schools can get real actual funds, real dollars into our hands outside of aid, which aid is a is a function to reduce property taxes. We'll talk about that in a second. Special education increase. I do want to spend one second discussing this. So the state did increase special education funding by 3.3%, 30% to 33.3%. And one area of focus that I have been in conversation with, with SWSA, with the WASB Association, and also WASBO, along with the region, is it's important to note that special education funding is not considered wholesome. So what that means is they take the prior year eligible fund 27 expenses, they put them in a bucket at the state, and they go, what's 33.3% of that bucket? But now, as you all know, last year's expenses for 27 are going to go up because health insurance increases. Transmission contracts increase, CPI increases. So what in reality, the current year expenses, we get 33.3% of last year's expenses when the reality ends up being we receive actually in real dollars about 32.5% of reimbursement. So one of the advoc one of the pieces we'll be advocating, again, beyond increasing that number in the next biennial budget cycle will be to get wholesome funding because that 2%, you know, not to pinch, pinch pennies, but it adds up. It's very expensive for school districts like ours to to fund things like that. So that's important to note. And then again, our per pupil revenue this year is $11,403. So again, want to spend some time here on the aid certification process. So a lot of times, and, and again, I'll, I'll bounce back and forth tonight. So please clarify if you have questions, but tonight we'll talk through the what's different from July and really the annual hearing, which is based on July certifications to tonight. And we'll also talk through what's different from last year to this year. Different comparisons, but equally important. So I want you to just uh, please note that. So it's important to know the difference. In July, DPI announces their aid estimates for all public schools. Those aid estimates are based on shared costs budgets. So school districts are required through the filings, the filing report status every month to submit what's your budget that was certified. Those budgets, they build estimates off of that for aid for this year. So last year's budget dictates July aid's estimates. Then what happens from July into October is school districts through their auditing process, the auditors are required to submit actuals. They're called shared cost actuals to the state. If school districts, the way it works, if school districts spend beyond their budgets out of fund 10 or their fund balance, they receive more aid, especially if they're already highly aided. So you can recall when a lot of you became on the board, when school our school district, who is considered highly aided, had very little fund balance, we had to run surplus budgets. Well, that has a negative impact on aid. So you spend less, you get less. So if you've seen the news, districts spending more and more, this has an impact on aid across the state. So we'll go through those tonight to talk through kind of like a high level what those look like. But I want to point to that because it's important to know that. Like districts that unfortunately that are financially responsible, unfortunately in an environment when districts are outspending budgets actually tend to not benefit from that. So it is what it is. It's the way it works. But just want to point to that as a as a point of conversation. So in October, we received this list from the state uh, to go through. Um, it really allows us on the 15th to get like 10 days to put it all together and see where you land, right? So we received final equalized property value. That's what ours is, the property value from the Department of Revenue for the school district of West Dallas, West Milwaukee. That is a separate process from what municipalities go through. Every year, school districts' property values increase or decrease with the Department of Revenue. It is not based upon a municipality's decision to reassess or not. Every year it happens. Enrollment, obviously, membership gets calculated. Third Friday happens. Uh, we receive equalization aid certification, as I just talked about. 
As Dr. Robinson mentioned, we receive private vouchers and special needs scholarship amounts. Those are from the private school's actual third fire account. Again, that's why we don't have those earlier. Uh, we we submit audit, audited uh, revenue and expenses. Those for all public school districts, we receive those formally. And then um, we receive both recurring and non-recurring exemptions. So an example of a non-recurring is if you decline an enrollment or membership, you receive an exemption, a hold harmless to give you more revenue in the short term to help you cut expenses long-term, right? Things like that. And then transfer of service, that's really tied to um, if we receive new students who have IEPs that we did not have services for, we're able to file what's called a transfer service exemption to the state to get increased revenue to hire those services for the students. Uh, a common example is a student gets is transferred in um, and they have a one-on-one -on -one aid in their IEP. Well, we don't have an EA for the student. Well, now we have to hire. It's a burden to the district's budget, so the state allows this process for districts to do. So that's just an example of that. So real, real specific here, I want to talk through what are the differences from what you saw a month and a half ago to tonight? So again, the revenue limit, uh, and we'll talk through these in more detail, so I won't go too deep here, but the revenue limit, that's the total allowable um, limit based on membership that we're able to, um, I guess, levy for the community and also aid. So that number went up uh, by about 800,000. That was due to a de uh, decline in open, open enrollment out students. So we have less students in our community choicing out. So it's a good thing, right? But that in, that those are considered members of the community. So when that number declines, we have a correlating expense decline and a correlating revenue decline. So that membership is on a three-year average. So we actually receive more revenue short-term and less of an expense in the short-term as well. So that's good news for us. We'll talk through where those dollars are being allocated this year, um, specifically to special education staffing. Transfer of service, the decline really comes down to how many students transferred in with needs outside of our special ed staffing so that number was 266 it's a correlating expense there's no concern there um declining enrollment that is the that is the increase of the membership decline so it's about eight hundred thousand dollars of um, increased revenue short term those will be uh you'll receive the we'll receive those funds in some capacity for the next three years this year and two more um energy efficiency levy that's a direct levy for our debt that we have um i think 26 27 is the last year for that so that'll be declining. And then again, wanted to point to private vouchers here. We budgeted about seven and a half million and it came in at 8.3 almost. So that's a significant increase. Last year was 7 million. So it's one point, almost 1 1.3 of an increase. We'll talk through that later. Equalization aid saw a decrease of $3 million um, given the increase of other district spending, also our um, equalized property value and the total tax levy at the bottom there. So we'll go through these, we'll go through the presentation. So we're gonna start with aid, the biggest bucket here. So equalization aid decreased by about 3.1 million from the July estimate to today, right? That's the comparison. So a couple of quick things. Property values in the West Dallas, West, West Milwaukee community for the first time really in my experience here increased by more than the average statewide. So it went up by one point, it went up by more than 1.1% beyond the state average. I think that we are at 8.79%, the state average is 7.69. So that 1.1%, again, if you go back and put this in real numbers, the aid estimate in July was 61 million. Well, 1.1% is almost $650,000. So that difference, 650,000 of that is tied directly to equalized property value. Those numbers aren't ironed out until October because you have to know what districts went up by more than what went down by more. Districts that go up by more who are not heavily aided may not impact you at all. But this year, you, you just don't know until you get it. So that's that. Um, the increased spending I talked about and then increased revenue and ESSER program falling off. Those are also factors too. The main two are the first two. So we'll talk through. I gave a couple quick examples here. So this is just a snapshot that our finance department put together for DPI to give you guys some concrete examples of like, well, what give us give me some examples of what districts did overspend or underspend their budgets, right? So here, here's some examples. You'll see in the news a lot of things about Milwaukee recently, right? So the news that I saw on TMJ4 was Milwaukee set to receive 50 million less in aid this year. Well, that's that's good to hear that, right? From other districts' perspectives, but districts' budgets this year aren't built on last year, they're built on July for aid purposes. They're built on July, not on last year. So MPS actually from July 1 to October, from the budget to the certification process from the auditors, actually had a shared cost increase of $61 million. They spent $61 million more than they budgeted. 
So that was a 7% increase. Beloit actually spent almost 12 and a half million more. Like aid was built upon what they budgeted, not what they spent. And so it's important to look at this because it shows you when we talk about $3 million and you look at the percent change, well, there's some districts that spent 18% more than they budgeted. So it's hard to predict, I guess, what's happening statewide in these environments of, you know, districts trying to find staff. I mean, there's many reasons I'm sure why this, this can occur. Districts could build construction projects out of fun time. These are all things that are plausible without diving into them. You also saw some changes we're seeing spent 8 million less. Sheboygan spent 3 million less. So it's, it's, it's across the board, but all these things are important to, to consider. And then you can see, well, how does that tie to when you spend less, you get less, you spend more, you get more, right? So Milwaukee, given they spent 7% more, received almost 6% more in aid. So the headline says 50 million less really was 31 million more, right? For our purposes. So it's important to know the difference. Are you comparing it to July or last year, right? Important to know. So I point to that um, as just the truth. That's just how it works. That's the current system. And if you can recall back to when the district back in 16 sold this building, you know, that was another example of increased revenue and decreased expenses that has an impact on aid as well. So um, certainly not the best of news, but just the truth. That's what we're working through. Um, we'll keep moving here. Declining enrollment exemption. We had an increase of $843,000. That was, I communicated that a minute ago. That was due to open enrollment out expense or membership decreasing. So that's an increase of revenue in those dollars. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, private vouchers. I want to spend a few minutes on this because this is, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, the reality is in this community, almost 18% of the tax levy goes to private vouchers this year. And we'll get to the WPCP in a minute, which is the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program and the impact that has on, frankly, property poor communities. But the reality is last year, the district the tax levy for private vouchers was a little over 7 million. This year, it's going to be a little over 8.2 million. So of the tax levy increase that we're going to see, um, a third of it is private vouchers, a little over a third of it's private vouchers. So these are dollars that we never see as a school district, but the community is responsible paying for. So um, the mill rate has a correlating impact of um, of the 611. It is $1 and 16 cents of it's directly to private vouchers. So um, really unfortunate. And I'll talk about this in a future slide. So again, how do we get to the total tax levy? It's the calculation is the revenue limit, the total revenue limit authority to district minus the total aid provided by the state produces what's an allowable amount that the board can certify to the tax levy. And again, those two, num those two numbers are issued formally on the 15th revenue limit and aid. So a revenue limit again um, is a little over 98 million and a half. That is an increase of about 2.6 million and a percent increase of 2.8. That's almost 100% due to the $325 per student we're receiving, about 3% of an increase in revenue. Um, again, that's great to see, um, but you know it's certainly not meeting our needs or nearly any public school, given the number of referendums in the ballot here in about a week. Aid, year, now this is year over year, right? Year over year. Last year, aid was about the same as this year. And um, so year over year, that's, you know, very little change, but July to today is the issue, right? Um, equalized property value. This is what I mentioned before. Our equalized property value across four municipalities, all different, but a net average was 8.79%. And it's important to look at the state average was 7.69. That 1.1% is about $650,000 of aid. And, you know, that coupled with the other areas is is the change in aid for this year. Quick question, Noah. Yep. I just want to clarify on this, you know, because a lot of municipalities did reassessments this year. Sure. This is separate from that reassessment. Like it doesn't matter that they did a reassessment this year yeah. for West Dallas or for New Berlin. It's just this is the process that they go through and they look at all of the, the property in the state of Wisconsin to come up with these numbers. Sure. Yeah. This is an annual process. There has nothing to do with Every municipality could not reassess in one year. This process still has to happen because of aid. Yeah. Yeah. The only way they could get around that is if everyone was in the same cycle, which they're not. And so some municipalities do it once every year and some do it every 10. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, private vouchers. We discussed this and we'll go through this in a minute because uh, the importance again is significant to our district, but um. We saw a 17.5% increase in private vouchers allocated the tax levy this year. 
and per state law, we're obligated to to pay that from the taxpayers. So that's just unfortunately the dollars of the levy the school district never sees. So I do want to take a minute to, to talk through this slide. If you have it in, in front of you, please turn to it. It's it's just really important to talk through because the story here is not fully written yet. So in 2223, I want to just show the historical here. In 2223, the tax levy was 40 million, and 12% of it went to private vouchers, a little under five million dollars. Um that was um, had a million impact of 81 cents. And the WPCP, the cap at that time was 7%. So if you go back to 2010, um, the governor at the time instituted private vouchers with a percent increase every year up until 24, 25. So this year it's at 9%. What does that mean? That means 9% of your resident membership can attend a private school through vouchers. That's the cap. If you're the if 9% is 100 kids and you're the 101st kid, sorry, you can't do it, okay? So the concern here is not just the increase that the community is having to pay for from 5 million to 7 million, now 8.3. The larger concern is that next year, the, the cap is lifted, it's unlimited now. And I think Dr. Robinson hit it in the head in his opener is that currently the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program, which is private vouchers, a fancy word for it, is tied to income restrictions, meaning if you're a family uh, below the poverty line, you can access private vouchers, meaning your student can go to private school if they accept vouchers and the taxpayers pay for it. The, the equity issue, the concern for our community, frankly, is that more families here can access that than families that have means to do so. And so school districts that are property poor are their taxpayers, their tax base are hit significantly at a higher rate with vouchers than our community surrounding us, frankly. And so next year, the question will be, well, what's that look like? The answer is we don't know. Because it could be, you know, it could go to 15 million, go to 10, it could go down. But given the trajectory, I would only anticipate that it would go up. And that is the concern. And so when they talk about lifting income restrictions, that's the concern for communities like ours, along with communities surrounding us too. But beyond that, from the tax perspective, the one thing that I want to point to is from a district's financials, not just the tax levy now, is private vouchers are, aren't the same as what we receive as a district. So in a, for a K-8 student attending a private school on a voucher, the school district, our school district, is required to pay that, that voucher for that student in a K-8 at $10,200. So in that situation, given our revenue for that student's $11,403, we receive a positive difference, right? You pay, you get more than you receive, about $1,100. But for most students attending vouchers, the school district has a net negative balance. It's a, it's, it's an expense beyond just what we, what the taxpayers pay. And so for a student that's in high school, we lose about $1,300. For a student who has an IEP, we lose about $4,000. And that impacts, again, school districts who, one, are considered more property poor because we're considered low revenue ceiling. So school districts who receive $15,000 of funding, or even with a special education student, they're much closer in terms of what they pay and what they receive than we are. So again, Dr. Robinson's opening comments are very well accurate. Um, so just the current reality that we're in and uh, you know, really hoping for, through the next biennial budget cycle, maybe this will get addressed because it's certainly not fair for our taxpayers or our district. Um, Okay, wrapping up here. So um, given the um, given the certification process, the tax levy increases a little over $3 million, 7.58% from last year. Um, again, given the factors we discussed. The breakdown of that is $38 million for the general fund. The jet service is energy efficiency debt. That's a, a levy from the community to pay that debt. We're almost done with that. Uh, I think it's 26, 27. And then the community service uh, fund 80 levy is seven and a half million to round out the 47 million that you see. It's important to note here that I just pulled this, that while the tax levy is at 47 million this year with inflation, with aid, as it's, as it stands across the state, given back eight years, the tax levy with inflation is still less, it's still less today than it would be with inflation. So it's just important to note that just kind of an interesting historical here. And um, in 2010, it was 46 and a half million. So it's interesting that almost 14 years later, it's 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 almost the same. So just just a, just a important to note that I know a lot of things go into that. Not something to tie your hat to, but just an important comment uh, that I know a lot of districts will be talking about this year. 
So the mill rate, we'll, we'll finish up with the mill rate and then we'll open to questions. So the mill rate is your total school-based tax levy divided by equalized property value multiplied by a thousand gives you the mill rate. The importance in the mill rate allows you to compare your district to area school districts because given every school district gets different different amounts for aid, you can't just compare the total tax levy because it doesn't give you a real offset of what actually you're paying as a community member because your property base is different. Your aid's different, your levy's different. So the mill rate is, I always compare it to an ACT score. It's a level set, it gives you a good comparison of what it is. So the mill rate um, is actually declining this year by over a percent. That's due to our property value increasing by more than the levy increases. So last year, our mill rate was $6.69. And given audited audited numbers are official now, uh, the state average mill rate was seven twenty two. So our mill rate last year, even given uh, the amounts you see today, are is, was 7%, roughly 7% less than the state average. So it's, it's important to know for community members. What does that mean for a community member? So for every $100,000 of value in your home, uh, $661 comes to the school district for um, for the tax levy. So you can kind of see the breakdown there by home. And then the all funds revenue and all funds expenses. Again, this number is consistent with what you saw in the annual hearing of a $700,000 deficit. That is due to the board previous and prior year committing $700,000 for the teacher computer refresh. So that 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 deficit really is not a deficit. It's just that $700,000 will come out of the savings account to make the, the payment for the teacher computer refresh. And then I did note that at the bottom here that um, the increased revenue was uh, allocated for increased special education staffing across our elementary schools. So that's really important to note. We've been working through those. Um, and Dr. Robinson can speak to that if there's any follow-ups that. So in summary, you know, uh, a lot of things have happened over the past month and a half. Uh, we saw an increase in the revenue limit, $800,000. We saw a declining, declining enrollment exemption, um, the private voucher increase from last year to this year, and then equalization aid decreased. But ultimately, um, you know, it's the board's authority to certify a tax levy. And so I, I guess at this point, I would, um, you know, pause and take questions, I suppose. So. Questions from the board? <laughs> Go. A uh, question on advocacy. I know we've talked a little bit in the past about writing our local representatives. Is there anything else that 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 uh, that's recommended? Like, what is what is the most impactful, most visible way for us to advocate for yeah. funding changes? Yeah, it's interesting because our committee discussed that a, a bit tonight. We just talked about you know how how we advocate likely just needs to change. And so um, one of the things that Dr. Robinson and I have been talking about is trying to actually sit down with our local legislators, because a lot of times when they're in these meetings and hearings, you know, there's conversations going on that they're not apprised to. And so to have someone they can reach out to, I'd like to develop those relationships. I think that is powerful, Joe. Like, I think if you can get someone to have a relationship with you that is making decisions at the state capitol, I think it does impact what happens because they just know what they hear about. The other thing I would mention too is, is and I, I, I can admit that I'm at fault for this, is I think sometimes leading with numbers is good, but also it doesn't tell the story of how it impacts kids. And the truth is that they're the ones who lose by stuff like this, our teachers. We've been talking for 18 months about how many staff we lose because of compensation, like our kids lose from it. And it's unfortunate that we talk about inflation and that's all well and good, but the reality is that it's students that are losing by this. And so- Finding a way to change that narrative, I think, is important. So I'll, I'm going to work through that with Dr. Robinson to tell the story, because the story isn't just that numbers. That's a part of the story. But yeah. Yeah. Ms. Kaiser? I'm really glad Mr. Becker brought that up, because I literally have a list of local politicians I'll be sending this workshop to, this action item to, because they need to understand how this affects our public schools, because I do not intend to have 18, 17% of what I pay into a public school district go to voucher schools that can that won't take our amazing special ed kids. They won't take our kids who have behavioral disabilities. They won't take, they won't take, but they won't take. But then that we have to take care of those kids with a decreasing budget because it's being taken from us. So that's a story right there. That's what we have to get out there. Any advocacy is good advocacy, though. You know, in any way you can, I think it's just important. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I've been, I've got the, the, the letter drafted in my head. I just haven't, uh, yeah. haven't, haven't, haven't put pen to paper. And that's yeah. just, thank goodness, Kaiser. I've got off tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be spending some time writing it. And, and, and typically the joint, the joint finance committee typically hosts four or five open forum sessions across the state. So last time I went, I know a lot of local school districts went. When that, that day comes up, I'll certainly invite you guys. You can get to testify to the Joint Finance Committee and tell like your story. And I think that is powerful. You'll see a lot of different representations, a lot of different municipalities there trying to advocate for their own funding, right? Because it's not just us, it's everyone. So Yes, please do. And, and that, that's that's the one I always think back of. I remember when when, uh, when you went out and spoke and, and I remember reading your letter and thinking that it's right on the money. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'd like to be involved in. Yeah. questions for the board just two points um i think regarding the vouchers that it's important to make so when we talk about um what the mill rate is going to be 661 dollars per hundred thousand 116 of those dollars goes directly to private schools that's money that we have to levy but 116 dollars for every hundred thousand dollars of value of your home is going to private school vouchers another thing that is important to note about this is 100% of that voucher cost comes from property taxes versus public school costs split between state aid and property taxes. So having a voucher is, in our instance, mostly twice as expensive from the property tax perspective than uh, if it was someone attending our public schools. We still lose that money, comes off of our aid payment, but it's money that would be cheaper if they were attending our schools for the property tax owner. I just want to make sure that that was clear. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I would look for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Any last minute discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That passes. Thank you, Aaron, for you and your team for all the work you've done in the last. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks guys. a lot. Aaron. Appreciate it. And uh, with that, we'll move on to our workshop this evening. Do we need time to set up? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So let's take a five minute recess while I'm gonna set up for our workshop. Welcome back from our recess. We're here to start our workshop on DLBA. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Brunch. Hi, good evening, everyone. We're excited to have um, DLBA leadership here along with um, their coach, Jody Landish and two teachers. And so I'm um, gonna really turn it over to them, but they're gonna give a great overview of celebrations that the school has experienced over the past several years. Um, they're also gonna be sharing with you all some proposed contract revisions that they've been talking to with their board, um, their charter board over the past several months. Um, so they're gonna be sharing that with you all. And then also just kind of their vision for the future and where they're headed as a school within our district. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Smith. All right. Okay. Closer. All right. So first of all, thank you so very much for giving us this opportunity to speak with both of you this evening. We truly appreciate and have so much gratitude for your attention and your energy. My name is Dr. Devin Smith, and I have the distinct honor of doing most of the speaking this evening. However, <laughs> you're so lucky. This is what I spend most of my time doing, talking. You can ask me my microphone procedures. But however, I am joined by my two sale team members, Dr. Matt Schneider and Ms. Melissa Sakura. So they're going to be covering some topics, extending some topics, providing a teacher perspective that I think is really important to get the full look at what's been going on. I, I don't think just my perspective is necessarily enough, but some of the things that I do and coach them through are the things that they're living every day. So I think they, they'll have some valuable information to share with all of you. And then moving on, who are we? So DLVA was established in the 21-22 school year. We are going into our fourth year of existence. So just kind of putting the faces and names of our staff and all of the individuals who have been working so hard um, going into this fourth year to create what we have finally come into in our fourth year of existence. That's not an updated picture of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That picture was taken a week ago. <laughs> so looking at DLVA's current mission, 
Deeper Learning Virtual Academy is a Wisconsin virtual charter school and part of the West Allis West Milwaukee School District. It is a tuition-free charter, charter school serving grades K-4 through 12 in an online setting, utilizing the internet and various digital tools to provide our school community with an anytime and any place flexible and personalized public school option. DLVA's current vision, our virtual program empowers students through a deeper learning framework that sharpens their self-direction, collaboration, and communication using digital technologies. DLVA students master academic content and develop the mindset necessary to keep them curious and engaged in order to live life on their own terms. In July, we created our theory of action. We went through the sale exercises just as everyone else. This is this is my sale team. I'm going to let Ms. Melissa Sakura go through our current theor theory of action with all of you. Um, there's a lot of text on that slide and it's very tiny. So I'm going to try to break it down for you a little easy, more easily. So our first um, goal or step is to look at how we can deepen the partnership between the supports we have at school and the supports we have at home. One term that we're using this year is learning coach, the home learning coach, not parent learning coach, but home learning coach. So it could be anybody who's lending support to the student at home. We're trying to get on the same wavelength so that the students have better support, which is gonna to lead to increased engagement, which is gonna to lead to a higher percentage of students taking our assessments, particularly the fast bridge, which will then give us better data so that we can tailor the instruction to help close learning gaps, when students are seeing um, an increase in their learning, it's helping to build confidence for them. It gets them to the point where they can set their own learning goals and utilize the tools that are in place to enhance their learning. Uh, so moving more toward that, um, a greater sense of individuality. As our students keep meeting goals, your actual grades in Edgenuity, which is our primary educational platform, um, begin to increase. They can become more accurate. It gives us better data again so that we can um, assess ongoing learning. And all of that leads our DLVA students to show typical or aggressive growth in math and reading on the fast bridge, leading to the big one at the end reaching the goal of all students having a three or greater on that value added evaluation on the state report card. That's all it is. <laughs> amazing job though. We'll be done by next yeah. Thursday. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm going to direct you to one of the handouts now. So this is the deeper learning aligned to asynchronous learning. This is the current iteration of this. This is something that was uh, worked on a bit and I am still being reflected on. This is, but this is that this is the current model of it. But even just in like discussing this a bit with Dr. Schneider earlier this week, no, or, wait, what is today? Monday? Monday. La <laughs> end of last week. <laughs> um, already seeing places that we're going to do some enhancements, but I still feel good about this current iteration. So I'm going to go through um, the um, competencies and kind of talk about how we see them play out in the asynchronous learning environment. So mastering academic content. Students can engage with content at their own pace, allowing them to spend more time on challenging areas and move quickly through content they master easily. This personalized approach ensures that all students can achieve mastery regardless of their starting point. We have something called a reteach, reassess policy. So when students do not demonstrate mastery on assessments, they go back to their teachers before they are given an opportunity to take the assessment again. It gives them a chance to do some investigative work as to why. Sometimes it is a matter of needing more support with the content. Sometimes it is a matter of encouraging the student, a student to slow down and take better notes. There's a variety of diagnoses we have made, but again, this, um, uh, our policy allows, has, has allowed us to see greater mastery over time in content. And I have pulled Edgenuity, we have pulled Edgenuity data that shows over time we're seeing 
better mastery. That's not the whole picture, but better mastery is something to celebrate, certainly. Um, problem solving and critical thinking. Asynchronous environments often require students to independently navigate challenges, fostering critical thinking. The flexibility and timing allows for deeper exploration of pro problems and creative solutions, with students having the freedom to revisit concepts and research further when needed. There are activities and projects built into our curriculum that gives opportunities the chance gives students the opportunity the chances to look for topics they're interested in decide the platforms they're going to use and then be creative with their design work so we do give them those opportunities and then before i get into the rest i just wanted to say this the virtual model is highly relational it is so contingent on the relationships we have with our students and our families I cannot tell you how many phone calls are made every single week by myself and by my staff. It's all documented. We document everything. So this next one, communication, is a big part of what we do in general. But while face-to-face -face communication might be limited, asynchronous learning encourages diverse forms of communication, such as discussion boards, video messages, and written reflections. These formats can pro promote thoughtful, well-crafted communication. And students can engage in dialogues that span time zones and schedules, enriching their perspectives. It is student to student, but it's so much more than that. It's student to teacher, it's families, student to teacher, it's students to other, you know, to IT trying to diagnose computer issues. Like the ability to express yourself through writing is, is valuable in this world. So to be able to write an articulate email to Dr. Schneider, or maybe to even Brandon, if he's still here, you know, about a computer issue, we go through this stuff all the time. So um, helping students with those skills as well. Kind of going into the same vein is the collaboration. So collaboration in an asynchronous setting can take the form of shared projects, peer reviews, and group discussions that happen over time. This approach allows students to contribute when they are most focused, and can lead to more meaningful and reflective collaboration. So a lot of, I would say, right now, as I've been doing many more walkthroughs and many more formal observations, a lot of it, a lot of conversations with staff has been, you know, how can we use some of these other tools to support the communication and collaboration? How can we use discussion boards? And how can we give students the space to reflect and then respond to other students? Um, so we've done a lot of that discussion lately. I have done that myself finishing a master's degree and a PhD almost primarily virtually. And so much of it was space to reflect and during discussion boards and to submit reflection assignments. And I always found that so valuable to be able to step back and, and like really think about what I'm writing and how I want to be thoughtful in my responses. Self-directed learning. The anytime, anywhere nature of asynchronous learning is inherently self-directed. Students must manage their time set goals, and take responsibility for their learning, which directly supports the development of self-directed learning skills. Another thing with this kind of falls into that communication collaboration. Sometimes we scaffold this self-directed learning by sitting with the student and helping them generate a schedule. It is, it is building ex that executive functioning to sit down and be able to say, this is how I'm going to schedule my day. And some students need support with that. So Ms. Sikora and Dr. Schneider have both done this many times, sat down with students and mapped out their daily schedule. When you sit down, this is what you're doing. So we are able to scaffold that self-directed learning as well. The academic mindset, when students are given the autonomy to control their learning process, they often develop a stronger academic mindset. The confidence gained from mastering content at their own pace, solving problems independently, and collaborating with peers can lead to a more resilient and growth-oriented mindset. Let's head back into the presentation. <laughs> Let's talk about some celebrations. So moving on to this slide. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're fine. This was a huge celebration and it was a lot of working with subject matter experts from various locations. It was a reading the laws or the statutes that govern the virtual space, and then generating our participation policy based off of this state statute that is linked in this presentation if you'd like to read it for yourself. But to summarize, it's participation over attendance. It's a very, it's very um, 
diverse in the virtual space in this state. So it really is a matter of students completing directives and us using data to decide is the student completing the directives. It's a mix of mastery and pacing. So we want students to stay on pace because they should be gaining standards at certain points, but we also want to see them mastering content. We're getting and keeping our students on track this year. It's just, it's a, it's a game changer. We monitor and analyze data. That when I talk about the monitoring, the analyzing data, I'm mostly talking about our ingenuity data. So if anyone ever has a free hour on their hands, I would love to walk you through a ingenuity progress report. Um, or one of our kids. That 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 would be great. Actually, that can be our that can be our Devin. showcase. In <laughs> Devin, do you mind telling telling everybody what ingenuity is? Okay, so Edgenuity is a learning management system that provides a set curriculum that our students use. And it provides a great deal of data to, to show us. It, it's also in a standards-based platform, by the way. So we can pull the Wisconsin standards that are being assessed. And Dr. Schneider can maybe talk about this a little more, some of those reports that we pull, but we can pull directly standards. And we do have some synchronous sessions where we use the standards to then align to those synchronous sessions to better support students with where they really need it. So if we have students who are, if we have a group of students who are excelling really quickly at a topic, then maybe we don't use a synchronous session for that. But if we notice that a large majority of those students are missing a certain objective or standard, then that lesson can be um, targeted towards that need. So I have sat through many formal observations and walkthroughs. Most, and I can think you come to my mind because most recently you, um, a, 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 a lesson on using evidence to support inferences. So based on, and he was able to show me in Edgenuity the report that had the standards that showed most of the students would need help in this area. That's also linked to FastBridge as well. Did that explain what it is or does anyone have any additional questions about Edgenuity? Uh, I think that was- Just wanted to follow up and say this as well. Edgenuity is also used in at Central as well as Hale for credit recovery. students who have- uh, yeah falling behind in certain credits, they can you know, get on edge and do and do credit recovery as well. Yeah, so the picture actually on the screen is an Edgenuity dashboard and it is color coded so we can um, easily see if a student is ahead in green, on track in blue or behind in red. But it does break it down to mastery, pacing. When I speak with families, generally Fridays I do outreach to recommended families from my staff. Uh, I can say this is the percent complete they should be at, but this is where they are at. We can talk about like mastery looks great, but we need to get the pacing up a little bit. It just, there's so much we can talk about then to know how do we really help the student excel. Sometimes it's a matter of not enough hours logged. So, you know, there's so, we can look at session logs. We can see how long the student was idle, how long the student was working for, how long they worked on all of their subjects. So it just, there's so much to talk about when we call families then. So um, that first bullet point is going to be talking about most of that monitoring and analyzing data for that first bullet point there is I'm referring to the ingenuity data that we, mo that we monitor and analyze and how much more there is to learn. But we have a pretty good hold on it at this point. <laughs> Excuse me, progress monitoring interventions in reading and math. That's from our FastBridge tests, our FastBridge tests. So we do have English intervention groups set up and we have math intervention groups set up as well and progress monitoring in FastBridge. Personalized support for students through outreach. Our students have multi-grade advisories and over a two week period, they are, their advisory teacher is uh, determined to make contact with each one of those families. And that's all documented and monitored. I can pull up every conversation. I can pull up the dates of their outreach. That is all there. Um, and my, I also document my own as well. So we have a lot of documentation. So if you hear the word document from me, I don't know if you'll hear it a lot, but we say it a lot at <laughs> So like we, uh, we say, if you did, don't document it, it did not happen. Yep. yep, and that's what we say. What did we say? What would I say? <laughs> what is said all the time. Um, so yes, I think like in terms of our outreach, we, we put a plan in place. It wasn't, I, 
I did a lot of research. We did a lot of research. We worked with subject matter experts, and I feel really good about the current plan that we have in place to best support our families and our students and to have the documentation to look back as a staff when we sit down and talk about our students together, which we regularly do, to say, like, what was done and what can we do to help the student. Okay, I'm going to do one more slide, and then I'm going to take a, a little break from talking and let Melissa talk again. Another celebration is like what it takes to onboard the students. So we call that our pipeline. That's also part of the spreadsheet we use. We have something called a roundtable spreadsheet. That's how we manage all of this. It's a very robust, very well-organized spreadsheet where you can pretty much find everything you need to find if you're a staff member. So when a student applies, if the application is viable, they get a phone call. We are trying to bring, like, we want to educate a family who's interested. We want them to know, so it's not a surprise. We want them to know what's, what, they're, what the type of educational model we're providing, this pathway is, to make sure that they do want this pathway. We, we want them to go to the right place. Once we do have students in, we give them, everyone gets a one-on-one -on -one orientation session with their homeroom teacher, where the teacher sits down, opens the laptop, and goes through all of the aspects of our school. We have a checklist. Our outreach is much more proactive and I feel like it's definitely paying off. And then we have continued follow-up with our parents and guardians. So we continue to support that online learning. And there's so much time of us just talking about our students. Let's talk a little bit more about what that improved. We can go to the next slide. We can talk a little bit more about that improved monitoring and feedback a little bit more from the teacher's perspective. And, you can get a little glimpse at the November newsletter that, that I've been work that is done actually that I worked that I created. Deborah's very proud of the newsletter. I'm getting really good at Canva. Really good at Canva. Oh, I love Canva. I, I added those leaves behind that. <laughs> it didn't come like that. I I did that. Thank you. That is how that is good use of my time. <laughs> now I don't know how to follow that, but okay. Um, one of the big celebrations that we have coming up is uh, the 55 for staff. Our school-wide goal was for students to be at 55% complete in all of their engineering classes. And we're talking about students that started at the beginning of the year. We have been going through and taking students since the beginning of the year until next Thursday, which is when our enrollment closes. So we uh, that 55, some of the kids get a little freaked out about because they're like, what, I just started last week. Not you, honey. <laughs> yeah. We'll work something out for you. <laughs> but 55% um, is the goal and kids reach for those goals. We set goals. Um, we had a strong start goal for any new student. 15 days from their start date, they should be between 13 and 17% in all of their ingenuity classes. It gives, it's kind of like um, pushing them in the deep end. It fully immerses them in what our program looks like, what it feels like, what they need to do to show us that they are ready for a virtual program. So 15 or 13 to 17% was our first goal. We had a 33% goal um, of two thirds of the way through first quarter, which would be one third of the way through the semester. There's a lot of math involved. It's great. 55% um, at the quarter gives our kids a 5% little cushion so that at the end of the semester, there's not a bunch of ah, <laughs> rushing and trying to just zip through things instead of taking their time and, and improving their mastery. So 55% is the next big benchmark coming up. Um, I like to say that there's a lot of celebrations that we do in our small groups, um, our cohorts that are split by the alphabet. Each teacher has their own cohort. Uh, we call them our spark groups. On Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, we have spark, which is um, from eight to eight thirty, and it's like a whole room. It's uh, they're multi-age, so I have in my spark group um, sixth grade through twelfth grade, and. We use it partly for business. So announcements, answering questions. Um, here's what's coming up. Here's what you need to be aware of. But then uh, we spend a lot of time just building community. 
one example um, from about, I think, three weeks ago. We, in my spark group, we played something weird, wherein you have two minutes to rush around and find the weirdest thing that you can. <laughs> Everybody so shares sure. their weird thing. <laughs> And we vote for which is the weirdest. <laughs> this year's weirdest thing was a skeleton sitting on a toilet. <laughs> Followed very closely, one vote off by figuring with a foot for a head. <laughs> so it was a it was a good good crop for this year for something weird. We also play a game called Count to Ten, which maybe we can do later if there's time. <laughs> See if you guys are as good at it as my students are. Um, that's. That spark group um, really belongs to me. Those are my kids. I'm the primary outreach for those families. So every two weeks, I'm reaching out. I prefer phone calls um, the best because I find it hard to have a real deep conversation through email. So I'm always looking to get that um, family member on the phone. If possible, family member and student on the phone at the same time. Um, but there are two week goals for all communications. And as Devin said, we log everything, every text, every phone call, every email. I think I have about 650 communications log for this year so far, which is, um, that's a lot of time. <laughs> we spend a lot of time on outreach because it pays off for our kids. The stronger the relationship is between the home and the school, the better our students are performing. So that's a big celebration. Um, one other, oh, sorry. 538. 538 mm -hmm. for me or you? You. You? Oh, I didn't log wow. last week yet. Okay, it will okay. be. Uh, it's still a lot. <laughs> 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 still... Thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just kept that, <laughs> that everyone has access to everyone. Yeah, the, 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 the point is that I can look that up right now. Uh, and, Melissa can check mine. Like, all of it's there, especially since we share students, right? So, like, the communications that we're having mm -hmm. that we can like, be part of that. Everything is there in our monster spreadsheet that has every single piece of data that you can imagine that can be generated by our school in the spreadsheet. Oh, robust. Robust. <laughs> okay. I am ready to one minute. Yes. Yes. So yeah. There we go. Okay, so we this was pretty big for us. Because we had the increased push right at the beginning of the year for um, that cohesiveness between home support and school support, we had a higher level of engagement from the get-go, which led to a higher percentage of students completing the fast bridge tests. It's a, it's a little more difficult to do it virtually than it is to do it in the classroom. In the classroom, you the bell rings, everybody sits down, they open their computers, they do the test. Virtually, we say, okay, it's time to do the test and all the screens blink off and hopefully they're doing the test. <laughs> um, mm. This year we had a percentage of, I wanna say at one point it was 92. It's a little um, convoluted because we have our elementary students working with WVS so technically the district counts them in with our population, although they don't do their testing with us. So of the students that do do their testing with us, we were well into the 90%, which gives us better data, mm -hmm. which helps us to create progress monitoring groups, which helps us to individualize the instruction for kids to shore up their skills, which then helps them to do better in their ingenuity. And makes us happy. Which was, you know, and as I'm gonna, are you? I'm good. Okay. So obviously, like back to our theory of action, that was a big deal for us. Like reviewing when we were at more like you know sixty percent completion on those fast bridge tests. That we don't have the data we need to help the students in the best way possible. So we really pushed. And I was on the phone too. Like we're all in it together. Like calling, especially when we got closer to that deadline. If you did not take your fast bridge tests, you were getting phone calls 
from not just your advisory teacher, but from multiple staff members, right? So we want that data. We need that data to help the students. And again, just to re reiterate, the virtual model is highly relational and our new restructuring promotes a better connection with, with all of our students and our families and makes us more accessible to them. Let's talk about the enrollment trends because that's getting into the next big part of this presentation. So I'll, I'll start with elementary. You can see that it's broken down by years. In 21, 22, we had 35. Um, 22, 23, we had 29. 23, 24, we had 17. And this school year, 24, 25, we have eight. Five of those students do come from the same family. Um, one of the students is open enrollment. So we are looking at currently having 22.8% of our original, original enrollment, meaning that from 21, 22 to this year, we've gone down 77.1% in our elementary enrollment. And as Melissa, Ms. Sakura has stated, we you, we buy instruction from WVS, which is Wisconsin Virtual School, which any school can buy. They're not a school in, in the in, of themselves. They sell instruction to other schools. So if you have a school who just wants to put a couple of students virtually, you know, you would buy instruction from them. That's currently how we are serving, servicing the elementary students. And we did something similar for most of them last year, not all of them, but most of them. Moving on to our middle school and our high school. And again, our enrollment is closing on the 31st. So middle school is down from when we started about 8.6%. However, we're going to close that gap I don't know if we'll completely close that gap, but it'll, it will be even smaller. It even has since I did this presentation originally, a shorter presentation of this for the committee and then built it out for this um, workshop. It has gone down even more. Like we've, we've closed that gap even more and we, we have a couple of days and we have a couple more students that were, so we'll see what happens. But either way, it, it wasn't a very dramatic decrease. High school is higher than we originally started. So our original, we originally ended with 62 in spring of 2022. Right now we have 67 and still have some students. Again, I'm not, there's still some students potentially in the, in the pipeline uh, before we close until we open again at the end of December. So we're not going to be closed for that long, but we will close for a, a bit. So that's, those are the current enrollment trends. And let's talk about the proposed charter contract revisions. Proposed change the name. So several places on the original charter contract, and everyone was given a paper version. And and you know you might not want to read it right now, but if you do want to take a look at it, you have it for light reading before bed. It's very <laughs> exciting stuff. So first of all, we'd like to make sure the name is correct in all places. So right now there's several places that say Nimbus Charter School Governing Board. We're not, I have an idea of where that came from, but no one's exactly sure how that happened, but we would like that to be updated to say the correct name of the school. So everywhere that it says Nimbus, we would, we would really like for it to say Deeper Learning Virtual Academy. So that one's pretty straightforward. Another change, proposed change would be how we're articulating our instructional method. It's currently the charter school will primarily utilize virtual instruction for delivering educational content to students. Instruction will be provided both synchronously and asynchronously. The methods for instruction will be centered around a continuum of play-based learning, project-based learning, and experience-based learning. We want to be more, um, we want to define it better. And since we have been studying industry standard asynchronous and synchronous, like virtual learning for places that are demonstrating or like generating data that would be considered successful um, and kind of like how we've modeled ourselves, we would like to update it to the charter school will employ industry standard asynchronous and synchronous instruction to deliver educational content for students. Teachers will utilize a learning management system to facilitate student progress through standards-based curricula and materials. Teachers will pull data from the LMS and other assessment applications that design and implement instructional support and intervention. Intervention. Students will work asynchronously a majority, so that's the 80, so it's called an 80-20 model, 80% 80 of the time and collaborate with teachers and or peers the rest about 20% of the time. It's called an 80-20 model. Some of our students are with their teachers more in office hours, but in general, this would be the vocabulary you would hear, the 80-20 model. Proposed change. 
address. This one's a pretty straightforward one, just like name. We have the wrong address. Our contract. So we would like it to say our um, current address, which is in the former Madison Elementary building. So we would like to change that. Let's go to the next one. Proposed change grade served. So this is kind of like one of the big reasons that we're here. So the current proposal, after discussing this with dialoguing with many individuals, is that we would alter our contract from saying 4K to 12 to just 6 to 12. So this is kind of like the big one we really want to be dialoguing about here. We've spoken yeah. with many people, and now we're bringing it to both boards to have this dialogue of, of you know, potentially making this change. We outsource the elementary at this time. We have about eight students, I think. I'm pretty sure it's still eight. We have one in the pipeline who, yeah, one in the pipeline right now that Dr. Schneider has reached out to and he's just waiting to hear back to talk with more. So I, yeah, I think like this is the, this is kind of like the star right here of like discussion, but not until we're done with the presentation. Okay, so <laughs> write, your, write your questions out if you have. Number, uh, slide 18, proposed change parent advisory board. Not to say that we're going to say no parent advisory board, but it's written in a very, very str like strictly defined way of how we will have a parent advisory board. And we are kind of, it's, it's I'd say the energy that was being put into it was not having the output that we would have liked to see. So we are hoping we can maybe make that a little less strict and say we will have a parent advisory board with four parents who, depending on what is decided with the grades served, might say enrolled in grade six through 12. Okay, last about the contract. This is just things that I, that we, I, I when I read this through with um, a consultant from Works, we kind of talked about like making this language a little, a little clear. So the charter school will adhere to the discipline policies of the district, and this will be, re the green is what we want to add, and it'll be reinforced through our student. We have one. We recently created this summer. I wrote our first iteration, and it's gone through a second and third, and will need to be board approved, but um, through a student family handbook that's that will also state this policy that we fall under the district, and um, you know, guidelines, policies, and also we have a supplemental book that tells more about what we do, which we do currently have, and it is linked to the newsletter that I make. So if you ever want to, again, some reading, you know, I made it in Canvas. So, and then the other thing is teachers and staff. So I just want to add that this says maintaining decorum in the online space, because it made it sound like more like decorum when you're in person, but we also want to say you should be maintaining decorum when you are virtual, because that is where you mainly are. So those are things that I, we would just want to add. Those are some small changes. Okay, we're getting close to the end. So vision for the future. Trying to keep it concise and simple. Growing capacity. Right now, our admissions policy has us at 217. We would like to increase that to 225. That turn, that's approximately 45 students per teacher advisor. And that's kind of what we're going to go for. We've rewritten the admissions policy. So that's what we would ask our board to approve that 225. We used to have grade level C caps. Since we restructured and this restructuring has been a game changer for us, I cannot even tell you. We don't really have to do that now because now when we were high school, middle school, you know, that we were heavy on the high school. So the, the ability to support was a little, the, the system was a little taxed, right? Now that we separate it and she, Melissa has all the grade levels, Matt has all the grade levels, like, and they have reasonable numbers, like our outreach is so much better. So we don't, it's, it's so much more accessible that we don't really need to have grade level C caps. And from what we can tell at this point, it seems to be working to not have them. The staff restructuring distributes a mix of grades six through 12 into all advisory cohorts. This really, this, this is this bullet point so true. It's a stronger human resource capacity for us, more comprehensive support for students and families. It's a higher level of service that we are providing now. I look through that edgenuity data multiple times a day. I do love to look at data too. So I just love it. And I do look at it. And when I look at it, I feel so uplifted to see the like how we grow and we just went through we had a meeting today where we talked about every single student in edgenuity and how they were doing based on that data and i just went down down the line 
We have a marketing goal to hit and exceed the CCAP by fall 2026. We are hoping to have, we really would like more open enrollment to expand DLVA and, and provide more virtual seats and therefore thereby expand the WAWM learning community. So we would be asking for a, a lot more open enrollment than we've had in the past. Restructuring for success. So this is a little repetitive, but I, and, you know, again, we restructured the system. It's not just more equitable for our students, it's more equitable for our staff. It was just like the, it was not, it was, it was really taxing certain parts of our system. And sometimes I just felt like there was no way I would be able to get on top of it. And like redistributing the staff assignments has just been a different world for us. Every single week we have budgeted time for collaboration, work time based on data. We sit down in real time and round table about our students. How many credits do they have And if they're in high school? How many do they need? Like what kind of deficiencies are we looking at? Any credit deficiencies? How can we how can we get them across that line? Is it going to be a 24 credit you know, across the line? Are we going to be investigating other pathways? But we are talking about them all the time. And then we don't just talk about them. Then the teachers make phone calls to them and say, this is it. Like, here are your credits. And this is, you know, this is our recommendation. And let's talk about it. What, what do you want? And we have these conversations all the time. I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with my teachers every week. I have been able to really actually do so much more coaching than ever before. So many more and walkthroughs, not just in a way to check a box, but walkthroughs where I can really start to like internalize themes that work well in my, in my virtual classrooms. And so that's been amazing for my leadership development in this learning space we have target and this then allows us to have more targeted pd like i see staff doing like different things and good things and then i'm like you should bring that to the staff like when matt showed me that report i was like oh my gosh you need to bring that to the staff we're gonna we're gonna make sure you tell the whole staff about that like but because i'm able to have these conversations because i'm able to do meaningful walkthroughs and not just like a, oh my gosh i gotta do a walkthrough like and actually sit down and go through like the clarification, like validation, clarification, stretching, you know, I'm actually able to do that in a way where I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. Like, let's dialogue about this. So that's been amazing. And so I want then, I'm actually going to pass this to Dr. Schneider and talk about something we're really excited about that Dr. Schneider has been taking the lead on and that eventually would um, culminate in another need for updating the contract for board approval from both boards. So I'm going to let Dr. Schneider take the next slide about our competency based pathway work that we've been, uh, that we've started, that he's done so much work on. Yeah, Dr. Smith. So, you know, we, we, as, as, as I'm sure you've gathered from the previous slides, we have really been working hard to collate, analyze, and take action on the data that we've been gathering. Starting last year, we started putting together the spreadsheet that like we were able to reference in real time tonight and include it. And we use that as the basis for a lot of these discussions, the celebrations that we have for our students demonstrating mastery, as well as paying attention, especially to our juniors and seniors who might be struggling on their pathway to graduation within the district. We are committed to positive outcomes for our students. And students who come into our school, especially in their 11th grade year or their 12th grade year, have within the first two questions, how am I going to graduate by June, my senior year? And right now, the district provides uh, a couple of different pathways. One that um, is now currently housed within the Madison building where we have our office is the GED option two program. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. Um, they service students who if, if in their senior year are credit deficient, then they have a pathway based on um, the, the, the GED standards that they can take tests for and thus earn the equivalent of a high school diploma and get their diploma by the end of their senior year. One of the things that is part of this program, though, is a screening process. Students must take and pass uh, an assessment that proves that they have a ninth grade reading level. And then if they are considered good candidates for the program, then the, um, the program will uh, reach out to them and offer them uh, a seat when one becomes available. But there are a limited number of seats. And for students who aren't able to get into the program, um, their options become 
really, really limited. And for a lot of students, it can be very demotivating to find out that you have something on the order of maybe six credits in your junior year when you should have like 18 by the end of it. What we want to do is create an alternative education pathway housed within our school that uh, follows uh, DPI guidelines, as well as aligns with the WAWM district standards for our students who can demonstrate uh, competency for the core subject areas. Uh, as I'm sure you know, like the, the, the state requires by statute that students earn 15.5 credits over all math, science, reading, English, social studies, FIA, they have to pass a comprehensive health and they have to take some sort of class in personal finance. Um, and then they are encouraged, the, the school boards are encouraged to require 8.5 uh, general elective credits. We want to focus on students by the time they get into their junior year. And especially since so many of the students who want to come to us are coming to us in their junior year your senior year, and they're coming in and the families and the students want to know, how can you help us get that diploma? And if they're coming in with five credits, I want to be able to tell them, we have a pathway for you that is very likely to result in you walking across that stage when you hit June in your senior year. And so um, that's what we're working on, a competency-based pathway. Um, this is something that is used by schools um, in different places across the state. I have an interview with the principal of Rock River Charter School uh, located in Janesville uh, this coming Thursday. I'll be reaching out to Racine Unified School District. Um, I have an extensive list of internal notes that I'm happy to provide to you for anybody who's interested on in the work that I've done for this so far. Uh, the bottom line is this, our students need to have a genuine pathway to graduate. We are supposed to be empowering them to live life on their own terms. We want to make sure that they have the education necessary and the pathway we're looking at will ensure that they have the competency in all of those core subjects required by state statute by the time they walk out our virtual doors and onto that page uh, at West Milwaukee Intermediate uh, in June. So um, the, the timeline for what we're going to do to develop this and bring it before all of you is that uh, by the end of January, we probably will have completed our research and our networking to find what we need to find. And we are going to be, uh, as part of that, we're, we're going to do an intensive PD workshop on our uh, PD days uh, coming up next week. Uh, we will have a proposal drafted by the end of March, and we intend to have the proposal submitted to the district leadership by April. Um, once we have received feedback and made revisions uh, to it by that point, we wish to seek uh, approval um, from the WAWM district school board, as well as our own governance board uh, by May. So that way we can be, begin to implement this pathway for our current students at the end of this school year so that when we are intaking students, onboarding them and making those outreach phone calls next fall, um, our families and our students will know which path to success they're going to be on. So right now um, I I have a, a mark of like digital contract, so we're just going to clean it all up with these some of these revisions that I showed you tonight. And it is it, it's going to need to be uh, we'll bring it to the board for four full board of people in December. So I'll bring it to my board in November, bring it to this board in December. And that will be those will be very exciting factors, I guess, for making those changes. So I'm referring to all of those changes I showed you for the charter. We will in the future we're working towards more open enrollment seats and um, working on our working on our uh, website our marketing. We have all that going on right now because we do feel like now that we have the infrastructure in place, we are ready. To start taking on the students and of course as though we take on students more questions arise so not trying to run at it as fast as we can but do it in a very reasonable way but we really do feel ready to have a higher enrollment now the, i can say that very confidently right now because of the work we did last year on the infrastructure 
We worked so hard on it last year, so hard on it this summer. And I do feel like the rollout was, it felt successful. So I do feel ready to increase the enrollment at this point. And of course, as I said, as enrollment increases, especially when we start talking about open enrollment, other sort of questions come into my head, but you know, we will have to build additional, we'll make modifications and have to build additional infrastructure as we would do that. And that is the end of our present presentation. I just wanted to say one more time, thank you so, so much for letting us come here and talk about our school. It really means a lot to us. So thank you for your attention and help. And now we are ready for your questions. I think. <laughs> I guess I'll know when you start that. <laughs> questions from the board. Ms. Kaiser? This is more of a comment. Um, I was on the committee that created the LBA and the absolute passion I can tell from all three of you for this charter school is just, I'm a teacher. Like I'm so inspired by all the hard work you've done. I love Jada as well. So we can talk. Um, but I just want to thank you so much. Like this is beyond the dreams of what we had when we first created DLVA as almost as like a offhand because of COVID and everybody else, you know, jumping into the virtual um, realm. But I, I'm just absolutely thrilled that we have some amazing people running this program, this charter school. So thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Carr? So I would just like to, I have a lot to say, but I'm, you know, it's late. Um, I do want to say that um, I, I too am impressed with the dedication and the, you are just so inspiring. Um, one of the things that you're doing by changing some of the um, those proposed changes, to me, when I read the changes, it's because you have morphed into who you really are. I think that some of the things that you wrote in the beginning were wonderful educational jargon and they were lofty generalized goals and now that you really know who you are as a as a team and as an institution you the changes that you've made are so new and so spot on and i i love that you took the time to go back and say wait a minute what are we what are we all about here these changes are important um so i wanted to say that um I do um, just have a quick question about, um, you know, the elementary kiddos. The, what about those nine kids? Or, you know, so you're you're going to go six through twelve. What a wonderful model. Um, you know, I know we're outsourcing them at, yeah. at this point anyway. Um, but you know, there is that little that that cadre of of kids in elementary that need you too. Yeah. So what will we? What will happen? So. The option is to, I mean, right now it could potentially just dissolve as of next year, and then we would two like two pathways possible, right? Like work with the principals of those schools to like welcome them back and figure out how do we put them back at our schools, and then we would welcome them back in sixth grade. Of course, like the message be very clear, like please okay. we have a seat for you in sixth grade. The other side would be if they want to stay virtual, then. I, I feel I will support them to find an, another virtual school. I have a lot of resources. I'm not, I don't want to let them down. So, and that's why this is a dialogue of like, what is the best? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm here to talk about it. And I think we talked about it a lot last summer and this is where we landed. Oh, this potentially being the best idea since it's a small group of kids, but it's a it's valuable conversation and dialogue to have, right? About we want them to stay in our district. We did talk about, like I said, how do we put them, help them feel comfortable going back and then welcome them back in sixth grade. Or if this is the route we go where we dissolve it, then I will support them and find them. I have resources I want them. So why do you think there was a drop in enrollment with elementary? I really think that, okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think part of it is that being the caregiver or learning coach of an elementary virtual student is a lot different than being the parent or learning coach of a middle school or a high school um, mm -hmm. student. In general, in order to have success, there has to be someone there with the elementary student all the time. Yeah. Because, yeah. 
you know, they're wiggly and <laughs> their attention span is a lot shorter. <laughs> and so I think it's a lot more challenging for families to provide that support. And I think a lot of families too, especially younger families um, who just have the kids coming into elementary school, don't fully understand what that virtual experience oh. would be like. Okay. And that's why I think we saw the declining elementary, <clears throat> excuse me, population, because we try it and you know, for some families it just wasn't working because they didn't have the supervision that they wanted or needed. And traditionally, from what I have seen, and I haven't done a ton of research on it, um, with virtual schools that are K-12, the elementary seems to be the smallest part of the program. And I think that's why, because they really need to have a lot of extra support at home. Yeah, that's 100% true. And definitely some of the feedback that I have gotten from families who transitioned back, back to their in-person school. I do think that in our first year, there was a, a I hate to say COVID, but there was a surge in COVID. Oh, but yeah. We ended up with a lot more students than we even imagined we would have in the first year. And that feels like a, a distant memory now, but that was like not that long ago, even though like a lifetime has passed since that first year we opened. Is so it's just so stiff, so different, um, in a good way. But I do think that played a part in it because I remember going from that year to the next year, transferring a lot of students back in person, from mostly elementary but all areas. Sure. Well, they're just, you have so many components that I just feel a little envious that our comprehensive high schools don't have as much honing in. And I, um, there's so many things that I, I really love about the program. Want to hear more? And I think I'm going to have to do a tour. I'd love to see, like, what is your day like? Uh, yeah. We yeah. have my new furniture pumps that day. Melissa, I have seen you teach. I would love to. I would, uh, no. No, the conference is really great, so call that okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Becker? Uh, a couple of comments and then a question. Uh, I, I appreciate how thorough the, the presentation was. Um, I, I've, we've had conversations before on virtual. Since I work virtual, I think it's really important that, that we're preparing kids to, to, to be able to, to survive in that environment. Uh, I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, so, you know, I was going to say one more thing on that specifically is like that being able to be self-directed and having a clue. What do you do when you're sitting there by yourself? Where do I begin? So that that was really interesting. I thought that was a great detail. Um, you know, we, we've kind of touched on it here a little bit from time to time, trying to understand how effective is our instruction after school? What does it look like? Um, so I, I wonder what kind of conversations you guys have and if, if, if you have any kind of mechanisms or or means of trying to understand, like, if if you're having those interviews with kids who are a year or two out of the high school, um, what are they doing? How are they doing? Is that is that on the horizon? Is that something that's on the radar? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was another thing. The documentation, the commitment to documentation and, and accountability. I think that's mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Hey. Um, I think especially now that we have, the, again, I hate to be repetitive, but the infrastructure was so key. Yeah. And once once I saw it and realized it and just literally asking people, how are you doing this? Like whatever it was that I was seeing that I wanted to do. And then us finding a way that worked for us. Um, now I think like items like those, you know, because first it was just like, the data, like the kids, like getting them graduated, getting them tested, like that was, you know, we, we, were, we were having some struggles. So now that we have seen, we're seeing so much more success, like I think long term, like, you know, that would be our, that would be significant part of our next steps for sure. Right. And I, I would just add that, like, part of, part of it is the timeline, like, we really cut our down for four years. So this is the first year that I have students that I knew as freshmen. Or in like mm -hmm. graduating, 
class mm -hmm. as high school students. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm now getting the students that like previously were just like middle school students, but now they're like coming up, but like we're, because of the restructuring again, like we're taking a much more holistic view starting this year, but like there are students that are like, that I've known from some of our in-person events and things, but they're now like, like my students. And I also get to have like an active role. Like, we all get to have an active role in students <laughs> six through 12, right? Mm -hmm. And so the goal I think all along has been this idea that we're going to attract different students from six through 12, if at all possible. Uh -huh. and really help them strengthen like these deeper learning competencies right that you're talking about like the kinds of executive function the kinds of focus the kinds of like outcome orientation that students in the digital space have to have like that stuff that we haven't had the longitudinal data mm -hmm. right that that we can now start to get our heads or our hands and heads around so i'm i'm really excited about that and um, it's just it's just honestly thrilling that like I'm gonna have there's a couple of students that I'm just like I'm gonna get to see them go across the stage like they were here here one right like it's yeah that's just yeah even right I guess it's teacher thing right yeah. like it's like oh I knew them a little bit yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. my kids from last year said that to me I'm like uh -huh. Uh -huh. Even when I got to you know, first high school graduation, I was like, well, this is the first time we're ever going to have a first high school graduation. You know, yeah. there's so many self, like special moments like that as we, we have this student honor of starting a new school, which I feel incredibly lucky to have had this opportunity to be part of this, truly, truly. And I think, and again, even like the fact that this year I'm more accessible, I can make phone calls to families. I feel like... Uh, from September and October, the current enrollment, I called every family. She's like, hey, how's the school year going? And then as it grew, yes, I've missed stuff. So sorry, I'm not, not giving you a phone call. But let us know. I wasn't going to call you out. So like, but every Friday, we have like some student conferences, we do phone calls, like it's just great. Hmm. Other questions? So I think the uh, moving to six to 12 is the right decision based off of the enrollment. And I think that, um, you know, what we could do for the families that we have now, I mean, it would be great if they decide to transition back to their neighborhood school. If that's not for them, if they want to pretend that, yeah, you know, we want, we love virtual, then yes, we should find them in our, you know, do our best to facilitate that move to a, a new virtual space for them. Um, it just makes sense. I mean, from a, everyone who's ever had an elementary student, I think it'd be very, just from a social perspective, mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. You learn so many social skills, go to school. And, and I think that, I'm sure that it, there's some kids that that's great for them, but I think the majority of them would probably be better served in a regular school mm -hmm. environment, just for their, as they get older and can develop a personality and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How do you interact with people? I just worry about kids who've done that since they were so little what they're going to end up being able to do when they have to go out to society and like talk to people <laughs> and interact with people or deal with someone they don't like like that's all stuff you deal with when you're walking virtual school so um i'm not personally sad to see that part of our virtual school go i think it would be the six or twelve is a model i think that is better better serving students um and we can see in our enrollment that that also matches out of curiosity because there was some time spent on this how many of our high school students are credit deficient when they come to you? We had the we had some of that data in a previous iteration. Um, well, give I, me I would say I would say a majority. We went into about half at the first iteration of that data. Yeah. I don't have the current iteration of that data, but we can give you that. Um, but when we went into the school year, I think we counted about half of them were like credit deficient. Okay. And is that a common trend with virtual schools that, at least at the high school level, you're dealing with students who are credit deficient? I could tell you that I've seen at other virtual schools that they have alternative pathways in place. So I don't know their data, but I can see that they have other pathways in place, which is kind of what inspired us to start doing some of this investigative work. Sure. So the reason I'm, I'm wondering about this is I'm just wondering if 
you know, we used to have Docky. Docky was our credit deficiency school. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of turned into the the deep learning high school that we have. And so I'm just wondering if DLB is turning into that their credit recovery space that we kind of don't have anymore. And so that's why I was wondering where we were at on that. I, I can answer, actually answer that. There, there are some examples where we are sending students over to DLBA because when they come, they, we're all noticing that they're all credit deficient. So we figured that it's a better option at this particular point mm -hmm. in that kid's, uh, that kid's development. So there are certain situations that we have under Jody's advice uh, to send them over to DLBA. I have a concern um, if that is what DLBA becomes, and that's really with open enrollment. So with DACI, when that was in that space, those were those were students that were in our district that were moved to that space. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about open enrollment, there's no struck like you don't know what you're getting. You know, it's a lottery system, right? So you don't know if all of those open enrollment students are now coming in as credit credit deficient, and so that could put that could quickly skew the students that you're working with and make the LVA basically, oh, that's where you go when you need credit recovery. And so I don't know, because there are some students that that's not what they need, but they they need a virtual school. So so there are only there are only a couple of examples like that. Each high school has a credit recovery program within it. Mm -hmm. They have their own. Mm -hmm. So we're we're we haven't just said, okay, yeah, you need to go to DLBA because you're credit deficient. There have been a couple of examples where we've done that, and especially when you have certain parents uh, who are seeking uh, intradistrict transfers, mm -hmm. and they're saying, hey, my kid has anxiety, and I don't want to send them this high school rather than go to this high school. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the transfer may be denied, but we do offer DLBA as an option because there are our kids. Mm -hmm. So those are some examples I can point to. So it's not becoming an alternative. I want to make sure I'm clear with that. It's it's only certain situations where we've done that. May, may I build on that? Because sure. that that is, that is like exactly <laughs> like what I would what I I'm only going to build on that to the extent that I would emphasize that like our goal is to serve the students that we see. Like we're looking at our data, and the the fact of the matter is that our our high school population is weighted towards 11th and 12th grade as it is, and so like. The part of putting a pathway like this in place is to make sure that we're serving the students that are already here with us, as well as the students that often like contact us seeking for a way. As Dr. Robinson pointed out, a lot of the students who come with us might be credit deficient to a certain extent, um, not necessarily even for, not necessarily for academic reasons, or it just might be that like there is something about like working remotely and the, the manner of the program we have that just fits with them very well. Mm -hmm. Our school's mission is to provide a virtual education for the students for whom a virtual education model is their best pathway to getting their um, their education. And for some, for some students, that is definitely going to require some sort of alternative pathway. Um, and for some students, it's going to be a much more traditional pathway of getting their 24 credits by the time uh, they get through high school. And, you know, again, as I said, we're seeking to cultivate students who come come into our school mm -hmm. early um, and we want them to stay with us. Like, and if, if it's especially, especially, obviously, if it's working for them, like we don't want them going anywhere else. We want them staying with a model that works for them. And so, like, I think our goal is not necessarily, I mean, if the point is taken that like, you know, things can very easily like uh, unintentionally <laughs> Uh, transform into into something else. Um, I just think that as long as the goal is always to serve the students that we're, we have, mm -hmm. and you know, especially like students like within the WA down the learning community, mm -hmm. like we want to provide options for them because if there is an option for every student, then we're going to meet their needs one way or the other. And I think that's like at least that's the way I see it as I'm as as I'm working on this. One hundred percent. And to add on top of that, um, learning is not optional at our school. The participation policy ensures that, like the state statutes, would support that students who are completing directives will stay with us. Students who are not completing directives, even after our conversations, our phone calls, our everything, if this is if this is not the right fit, then we are going to support that student 
to the right fit, that if this is not the right fit, right? If the, so yes, we have this pathway, but it doesn't mean that just every student would come to us and stay with us. They would have to be learning, demonstrating proficiency, working, that part of it. Our participation policy is very, in my opinion, solid and very clear. And families are, it, it is told to families many, many times and students many times. It's a three letter policy and it is based completely on the law. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I'm not trying to be critical of the credit recovery or any of that stuff. I think, you know, obviously there should be a path for that when there's a need for that, you know, and, and I 100% you know, believe that you're, you're um, supporting your students as best as you can in the ways that they are needed. Uh, my, what I'm talking about, I'm seeing the growth goals that you have, right? So perception is reality. And so docu for a very long time, well, that's the school you go to when you're failing, right? That's the school mm -hmm. when you can't handle regular high school, then you go to docu. And that's still, to this day, something that they fight against. So you're new, right? And you're trying to establish a reputation in the in the virtual space. And so all I'm saying is that when you are coming, when you're doing your marketing <laughs> strategies and things like that, is to keep that in mind. Because yeah. if within the community, if within the high schools, the students say, oh, so-and-so went to DLBA because they were failing, that becomes what the community thinks DLBA is for. Mm -hmm. And we don't we don't want that to be what DLV is for, right? We want everyone, yes. regardless of what they want, if they think virtual is for them and you think virtual is for them, then that's where they go. Yes. So I just think we seem to be cognizant of that when we're going forward, especially with our marketing and strategies. You know, I go to Market Cinema and I see the the things before the movies for the Virtual Academy that's and it. Walker Shaw and stuff like yeah. that. So that's I'd love awesome. to see W Day up there. You know, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, see the <laughs> but I just want to, I just... When I was hearing this and then thinking, okay, what percent are we at? And again, we can't control that, right? We only can, we can be able, we can take what we take, what we get, right? Right. Uh, but we just want to, I just, I think the messaging on that is very important. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's that goes to that growth that there's so many questions mm -hmm. with the mind, with the growth, you know, and that still needs to be structured and controlled to some degree. And I, I I really appreciate what you're saying and I agree with you. I also don't want to become like them as the family school. So um, I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. I'm not a medium or sensitive or anything like that, but uh, I'm just saying that, you know, I, 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 I have no crystal ball. I'm familiar with like but I want to, you know, the community has, you know, they're looking for things to put out kids in. What is this for? And and why would anyone want ever want to go to virtual school in high school? You know, all sorts of things. But, oh, only because they have to, right? No, that this is, is a choice that you have to make for a lot of reasons. And so yep. maybe listing those reasons that that you know from your own students as to why they came to you. And it's not just because they were credit deficient, right? So that's the thing that I think we focus on. Use the benefits of having you know, asynchronous work, mm -hmm. lots of people, people who can yeah. set their own schedules, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Those are the things that that's where you go to a virtual school. We want to market it around those, those deeper learning policies, the deeper learning yeah. policy framework. And I've always been like really clear mm -hmm. with your mm -hmm. marketing and people. Like I've always, I've been really clear that that's what we're bringing this around, not yeah. through these other things. So the other things may exist, mm -hmm. but it's always going to be around that deeper learning framework mm -hmm. that is part of the district and we want to be focused with that. So completely on the same page as you with that, for sure. But you're still having days where everyone comes in person. Is yes. that still something? Okay. Yeah, right. we have one for that. This is scheduling it. So and this is this is organizing it. So oh, uh, expect yeah. it to be amazing. I I Mr. Becker is next one and her in person days. Somebody else was too. Sales. I was at the graduation. I went to yeah. do I have an yeah, been our graduation speaker. I need to open the spark to see what those morning sessions look like. <laughs> Any additional questions? You know what? You could market college prep. There are a lot of things mm -hmm. that you do that is very yeah. college prep. Look, think about you getting your master's and your doctorate. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you did. Mm -hmm. What your kids are doing. Is yeah, what, exactly. But it's, it's how it's I'm, I'm telling you, it's work it's here. Exactly. And this is like my dissertation. Right. Yeah, yes. so all the marketing materials now. Yeah, at least it will lose count. <laughs> yeah, my staff can speak for me a lot about talking about my PhD. Well, thank you. Thank you so Donna, much. Thank, thank you for all your work. Any other questions? No. Well, thank you so much for coming and presenting. Thank you for being able to Thank you all. Later in December, then. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Great. Yep. All right. Bye. Well, that I think that's the end of our workshop. So mm -hmm. I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 The last minute discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.